welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, posting Facebook comments declaring what is or is not music, or else a scrappy upstart wondering just why after an entire year of guitar lessons you still haven't been offered an appearance on Conan. Either way, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most. An ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us this month, our first show of 2017. The live shows that I got to play last week in the Pacific Northwest were wonderful. Thank you to all who came out to the Doug Fir in Portland and to Vancouver and to the Tractor Tavern in Seattle. I'm just starting to meet people after shows who have gotten to know my music through the podcast. So that's a first. That's a new and exciting thing. I'm glad to meet all you guys after the show. Thanks for being there. I always like to let you guys know where I'll be playing in the coming months in case I'm coming to your town and you'd like to hear some of my songs live, or maybe I'm coming to a town where you have friends or family and you'd like to harass them into coming to one of the shows. That works too. On Saturday, February 4th, I'll be at the Lincoln Theater in Raleigh supporting American Aquarium for their annual Road Trip to Raleigh weekend Uh, They just added Will Hogue and his band to that bill um, for the 4th, so needless to say, that will be a great night of music. Then on February 16th, I'll be at the Boot and Saddle in Philadelphia, wonderful little club that they have there. On February 17th at City Winery in New York City. The 18th, I'll be at the Tin Roof in Baltimore, Maryland. Then on March 18th, I'll be at the Anastasia Music Festival in St. Augustine, Florida. Also, if you live in Texas, I'll be adding some Texas dates very soon, so keep your eyes peeled if you live in Austin, Houston, Dallas, or San Antonio. Former guests of our show have been busy in the last month. Tift Merritt released her new album, Stitch of the World, today on Yep Rock Records, so congrats to her. Just last week, Casey Chambers released her new album, Dragonfly, with Warner Brothers in Australia. Hayes Carl taped an episode of Austin City Limits that is airing this month on PBS. And Robbie Folks was nominated for a pair of Grammy Awards, one for Best Folk Album and another for Best American Roots Song. So congratulations to the whole bunch. That's very exciting. If you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor, there are two quick, painless, entirely free things that you can do to help out. First, you can rate the show from within your podcast app. You can give it a review um, there uh, on your phone. It's very easy. Don't ask me why it's important. I don't completely understand why it's important, but uh, I suppose I'm told that it is. So please help me out there. Or you can share the episode with uh, friends who you think might dig it. And you can do that via the app by emailing or texting them a link to the podcast. Or you could just go old school and simply tell a friend, tell a coworker, tell a like-minded music lover who you think might be interested in the program. Uh, that would help me immensely. The, the listenership for the show has been up in the last few months that I've been asking you to do this, and uh, it's a direct result uh, of you helping out. There's no advertising. There's no this, that, or the other. Um, We're not on a network or anything, obviously. So you sharing the show has helped grow the community, and I I really appreciate that. So please continue to do that. And as always, the simple math with uh, the two of those things is that they will help the show much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. So (laughs) help me continue to do that math. Uh, It's much appreciated. Finally, and I haven't mentioned this in a while, but I'll start harping on it again. 
If you have suggestions for guests or topics or the layout of the podcast in the app or where else you'd like to access the program, all questions, complaints, whatever, drop me a line at theworkingsongwriter at gmail. I love to hear from you. Some of the guests that I've hosted so far have arisen directly as suggestions from your emails, so keep them coming. That's it. That is all the harassment for this month, you guys. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope you enjoy our chat. My guest this month is Sarah Watkins. Born in 1981, outside of San Diego, California, she was a one-time bluegrass prodigy who has since established herself as a songwriter at the vanguard of American Roots music. She began playing music at a young age with her brother Sean and a precocious kid named Chris Thiele. The trio eventually formed the group Nickel Creek, and became something of a sensation on the California Bluegrass Festival circuit. Their eponymous debut was produced by Alison Krauss. It sold well over a million copies and placed them squarely within the Roots Music revival, which followed the Coen Brothers movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Nickel Creek would go on to be nominated for and win a slew of Grammy Awards, Country Music Association Awards, and International Bluegrass Music Association Awards, only to part ways in 2007. Since then, Sarah has pursued a solo career of her own, she's founded the Bluegrass Supergroup On With Her, and she's established a legendary Los Angeles residency called The Watkins Family Hour. She has appeared on The Tonight Show, Conan O'Brien, and she made history of sorts by becoming the first guest host of A Prairie Home Companion. The New York Times has called her an Americana virtuoso with a voice of plaintive clarity. Pitchfork called the Watkins Family Hour record that she made a crystalline collection that offers compelling insight. Of her latest effort, NPR has declared, By now, Watkins has been in the spotlight for half her life. Never before has she made her voice heard quite this clearly. I've been pestering Sarah for a while now to appear on the podcast, and a few weeks ago, between tours and rehearsals and sessions, she was kind enough to devote a few moments to our show. And for that, you and I are very lucky. So... The first time that you and I met, we were at the Pickens Theater in Newport, Rhode Island, where you were hosting a musical review the night before the Newport Folk Fest, and I was one of the guests, and I will never forget my first impression of you, uh, because as soon as I came in, you breezed over and said hello, uh, made sure I knew what the score was, and then you zoomed off and spent the next three hours before the show revising arrangements, changing the running order, physically moving performers from one spot to another, acting as armchair (laughs) psychiatrists for other guests, basically just kind of calling the shots from the wings like some kind of uh, like musical Bill Belichick. And uh, (laughs) I was very, I was transfixed. And I said to myself in that moment, now this is a person I need to know because this is a person who eminently... uh, has their shit together. So uh, the purpose of wow. this interview, Sarah, is, is, uh, will be less to get your insight on music and more to get your insight on how the rest of us can get our shit together. <laughs> well, that is a huge compliment. I will, I will say that I, I, I know that that's true, that that's when we met, but I feel like we've known each other for longer. Uh, if, um, we've been running in similar circles, but that was definitely the first time uh, we formally met. Um, the first true true hangout. Well, you know, it's it's funny. I, I am. Um, that was a, a really fun show to put together, and my brother and I have um, have learned a little. A, like every time we we put together some kind of, you know, huge night of of a variety of musicians. Um, we've gotten a little bit more attuned as to how to how to be in two places. So you know, I'll be doing something on one end of the stage, and Sean will be 
um, learning songs downstairs to communicate to me and the rest of the people when we were actually on stage and um, or vice versa. And it's, it's really nice to, to be able to, I mean, I don't think either one of us would really enjoy doing that kind of night without a teammate uh, like the other. Well, sure. But I'm, I mean, what I really appreciated about it, and I'm sure you've been a part of nights like this, you know how sometimes when one of the artists is running the night, sometimes they'll want to be too cool for school and they won't want to just give people direct orders and directions. And so everything just ends up really loose. Yeah, I've been, I have, I've been a part of those nights and it's not fun. And, no. You know, I, I had a, um, it, I think that a lot of times, I don't know about other, other people who are leading those kinds of shows, but in my experience, um, communication is often helpful, however nerdy and, you know, um, seeming, seeming to care too much about things that might not be important. Um, I was teaching at a camp in Winnipeg before the Winnipeg Folk Festival, and we were um, putting younger, less experienced musicians together into groups to sort of act as a band for an afternoon and, and experience that kind of interaction and collaboration. Mm-hmm. And I think it, I remember encouraging those kids to actually communicate because there's often this situation where, you know, two verses have gone by in a chorus and something's going to happen, probably not another verse, but there's not any communication of who might take a solo or, you know, what's going to happen dynamically. And um, I've learned from watching people who I consider to be the hugest professionals who who communicate things by like yelling the name of a person on stage who's going to take a solo. I remember seeing John Bryan at Largo who, you know, being on stage with, you know, three epic, four epic, five epic musicians who all know their way around a song really well and just, you know, enjoying the fact that you, that, that you say, you know, so-and-so take a solo. And that's a, something that comes from the tradition of bluegrass, I think pretty well where you, you, you do, Someone does lead the lead the shots and and help the everyone else on stage. So speaking know, of know know what they're thinking, you know. Speaking of bluegrass, that is your background. But when I think of Southern California in the 1980s, where you grew up, the first images I conjure are certainly not campfire circles of people singing Stanley Brothers songs. It's more like. Uh, like Lords of Dogtown Bros skating in mall parking lots and listening to no effects. So, <laughs> how did there you... aren't enough documentaries about the bluegrass scene in, the <laughs> in, in San Diego. Uh, so, know, how did you end up with the fiddle in your hands? I really lucked out. There, there actually was a good scene. Um, in the in, I grew up in. I was born in 1981, and my brother is four years older. Was taking music lessons, and we, we ended up going to the uh, the piano teacher's um, son's show. This is John Moore, who's a mandolin player in the band Bluegrass, etc. And they were a huge anchor in the bluegrass-ish kind of scene in Southern California. Byron Berlin was also hanging around. There was an L.A. fiddle band. There were a bunch. There's a good scene in, in the Bay Area. And uh, my brother and I, my parents took my brother and I every week to see this residency that Bluegrass Etc. had at a pizza parlor. And we became friends with that whole community of people and and the band, and they would have us on stage to sing. I remember being four years old and asking this, you know, the John Moore, the leader of the band, who I considered a personal friend and also had a crush on. Mm -hmm. um, I requested Long Black Veil. And he said, well, we'll do it, but only if you sing it. And I and I only knew the chorus, so he got me up to sing the chorus. And then, you know, every week or two after that, he'd get me up to sing a song I learned in kindergarten or, um, you know, something else. And then I started taking fiddle lessons from the fiddle player named Dennis Kaplinger. Byron Berline is a great Oklahoma player, lived in, in Los Angeles for many, many years. And um, he would come down and there was a really great scene of young players. We would go to festivals together. Gabe Witcher, who's a, who's a great friend and, uh, and an incredible musician. He, he and I, and a bunch of other kids, Chris Feely and, and my brother and, and so many other people who, who we still know would go to these festivals and just play tunes and, you know, 
play in the river together. And, That's so and listen special. To a sixteen-year-old Allison Krauss play at a festival. It was it was really a special scene, and I feel very lucky to have been around during that time. It's special in the sense that it sounds like, in a way, your musical idols. For a lot of kids, their musical idols are these people that they hear through the radio or saw on MTV and who are these um, kind of untouchable um, figures on high. But for you, it sounds like you could kind of reach out and touch these people that you looked up to. Yeah, that's one of the beautiful things about about that festival scene. And, and for me, it was, it was in Bluegrass that the best fiddle player, uh, it's kind of odd and, and, and also folksy that, like, the, the, you know, if you were a fiddle player of, of note going to these these little festivals, it was kind of assumed that you would do a workshop, right. which means you're sitting um, maybe on a picnic table, maybe on some chairs under a, under a little tent, um, talking to a bunch of other festival goers, answering questions about being a fiddle player. And you're probably going to be there with two other fiddle players who are hired to play the festival. And I remember going to festivals and, uh, and, and that being a huge thing. Oh, you know, um, Byron's going to do a fiddle workshop. Stuart Duncan's going to do a fiddle workshop. And these are, you know, these are, sorry, I have my alarm going off. No, you're good. These are the, be- these are the best people, uh, the best musicians. And you get to learn from them personally and you get to ask them questions and talk to them. And, and I think, um, the the line between audience and performer was was very gray in a lot of a lot of times and um it made being a musician seem more normal it didn't make being a musician seem like um something other than me it seemed like oh everyone plays guitar and sings songs that's just what people do and i think that that um that in, in, encouraged me because i wasn't you don't know, think about I wasn't thinking about a profession at the time. I was just thinking about what I wanted to do next weekend, right. and that was you know go to a festival and enter a fiddle contest and see my friends and play tunes and try and get better for next summer. And uh, it was it was a really really great scene. And and like any traditional form, um, there's often a, a great generosity to the younger the younger generation coming up, and because they want to keep that tradition going and. Um, I bet definitely benefited from that. I, I'm racking my brain here to try and think of another art or another craft where um, the people who want to pursue it just have immediate access to uh, the most world-class practitioners of it um, at, at any given time. I mean, that's, that's a pretty healthy uh, process and community to be a part of, it sounds like. Yeah, it was, it was really wonderful. And, I think at the time it seemed it seemed really cool, but looking back, it it is like you said it's it's not terribly common. I think in smaller crafts though, like I imagine if you go to um, if you're learning any 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 art form that that seems like it's you know reliant on on a new generation to come in to keep it alive, mm-hmm. I think you will find that that it is it is quite encouraging and to to the the younger kids coming up because. They want to, um, I don't know, maybe there is that balance of, you know, keeping it traditional and then also, you know, they're, they're, uh, while um, some people I think are, are reluctant to, to engage in the upcomers because they might change uh, the thing that they love about the tradition. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think that's one thing in California. It is, an, it, we were far enough away from the roots that, that all I maybe I was blind to it, but all I, all I experienced and received from it was, was encouragement. And, um, my parents were great enablers. Describe to me, what did it feel like in, I guess it was probably the late nineties or early two thousands when uh, I, and I guess it was, Oh brother, where art thou that really catapulted, um, Allison into a whole different level of popular culture, awareness and, and stardom what did it look like from your end of the world to see that go into the wider world and gain recognition? Well, um, so at that time, Nickel Creek had just made our first record with Allison. Allison Cross produced our, our first record that was properly released on a record label on Sugar Hill. And 
we actually, my, my perception of that time was, was, um, that we actually got picked up in that wave of popularity as well, even though <clears throat> Nickel Creek didn't have anything to do with that soundtrack. Somehow, in a lot of, of articles of note that were being written up, because the, the, that, was, that was a hugely popular moment in music for, for bluegrass. Yes. Um, Nickel Creek was mentioned in, among those artists of, of that... Of that um, category in a lot a lot of articles a lot of press and and the enthusiasm that was surrounding that that moment picked us up as well and we benefited hugely from that i think that was a big lucky blow for us because um uh it it really helped lift us up and 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 give us a huge like a, a much bigger following of people, just publicity. It was um, it was a great stroke of luck for for Nickel Creek, and um, particularly because we were involved with that. we were had been working with Allison, and we were just we had just been in the scene long enough, I think, at that point to have proved that we're going to be around a little bit, and right. Um, Man. And then you know those kind of things just sort of. It just continued a little bit. From yeah, that. yeah. That's it. Just I love thinking about moments like that. That are very. They got to be really heady uh, for a young artist. And it's like all of your practice and preparation. And it. It's not like you were sitting around a campfire at eight years old thinking to yourself, "I'm doing this right now so I can build up a skill set so that when this takes off in the public consciousness ten years from now, I'll be ready." You were just doing it, you know. Um, yeah. But it's yeah. neat. When that sort of uh, preparation and love for the art and craft does meet a a moment that takes on a life of its own popularly, yeah, and i've I have noticed that over the years it it, it I have seen and and sort of pointed out that that to myself that you know you have to you have to do the thing for yourself for long enough for you to care about it and be develop into um or be the the play the kind of things you want to hear come out of you and 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 write the songs that you want to be able to sing for me anyway that that's been a um been something that I come back to every every so often when I'm searching for some kind of identity or or relevance that i have to go inward and figure out what i want to do for myself because ultimately if you're doing it for somebody else you're going to guess wrong and then you're going to be unhappy and uh because you you're having to work to um replicate and every night on tour the sound that you don't really identify with and i think it's very hard to be successful if you're just guessing and I've been terrified of having to just guess. Like I remember, yeah, when I was um, when I was starting to make my first record, which I thought was just going to be a side project for a while. Um, I was, I was, I knew it was time for me to put something out, but I, I was a little terrified that I would be guessing stylistically as to what I would want to do. And so I went into the studio and and with with like a few different groups of friends to try out some different styles. Like I made, I recorded some sort of more countryish kind of songs. Oh really? Um, like Nico, K- Nico, Nico case cover, a Nico case cover and, and some other things. Um, and then I, I recorded with, uh, I, I did like a very, very folky or like much more stripped down acoustic thing. And, and I tried a, another band with a couple of weirdo, musician sounds mm. and tried to figure out what I wanted, which direction I wanted to do it all the while being fairly terrified that I was just going to guess wrong right. and, and then have to do, suffer the consequences for the next album cycle or two. And, um, and that was around the time that, you know, family hour, the Watkins family hour had started. And that was basically a, a home residency gig that my brother and I have done for, yeah. you know, 13, 14 years now. And that gig enabled me to just try out a bunch of different things and figure out who I was outside of 
Nickel Creek, which was the band that had been my sole creative output from my entire life until that point. Yeah. And it was this great opportunity just to, you know, sing a Dolly Parton song if I want to, sing a Jackson 5 song if I want to, sing a, you know, sing a song that's half written that I don't know how to finish yet uh, for, for an audience that's willing to listen and um, play tunes and, and celebrate the music of other songwriters who I, who I respect. And it was, it was a huge relief to just um, be a fan that got to play these, be, be a fan of music again and celebrate things on stage with people. And um, it slowly enabled me to, to, you know, find my way into what ended up being my first record. Yeah, and I think the business of trying to predict what's going to come next um, in music is a fool's errand. You can, yeah. I mean, the, you're you're lucky if you can find and find a way into what you enjoy and and learn how to do that well. And I, I think that that is uh, for me the the only the only thing because at the end of the day, if you have to get a um, if you're you know if you're if you're not able to to tour for a living, which is a hard, a hard way to make a living. But if you, if your bread and butter comes from a nine to five job, the end of the day, you get to play songs that you want to play for yourself and you get, or for your friends, or you get to do a couple of gigs on the weekend. And, and the, the thing that, that, that I get satisfaction when, with, when I'm between projects or feeling like every freelancer does, you know, this, I, I, I'm struggling with this right now where I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel either overwhelmed because I have way too much on my plate or as soon as I'm not anxious, I start to panic because I'm obviously wasting time because I'm not overwhelmed. <laughs> right. And, and so I've been trying to, to not be in that, that state, but to just enjoy, you know, just to spend I know. my time doing other things and, and not be, um, but that's the insidious full part. Time, all the time. That's the insidious part of owning your own business. Is you know what? When things slow down a little bit and you start to get worried, you're not paranoid because you do need to find work. Because six months from now, you got to pay rent and the light bill, and uh, they're not going to pay themselves. Yeah, so it's justified. It, it totally is. And that's the but problem. I find that yeah. the, my calm is my calm comes from, comes from um, from. Being able to, I mean, not that it helps the lights go on or anything, but there is a relief in knowing that I can sing a, um, you know, a Washington Phillips song to myself and be nourished by its goodness um, because of what it is. And I think that it's very important as a musician to continue to, to, be a fan and be allow yourself to be nourished by this thing, um, and be on the re- <clears throat> be on the receiving end, because um, that's what ultimately um, feeds me enough to 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 feel like I have something to go out and say, or I have I, I'm not just a uh, a machine that plays these you know twenty songs every night. I'm um, Mm-hmm. And someone who was touched by music and wants to um, inhabit that each time that I that I'm playing songs. Frida Burkhoff had a vision. Even as a young emigre from Russia, touring the U.S. on the vaudeville circuit, she knew. She wanted her very own space for live performance. By the end of the Second World War, she finally had enough cash and decided to commission an architect to build a theater on La Cienega Boulevard in Los Angeles, calling it the Coronet. It was a grand art house in a big movie town. What she needed was a show. Unbeknownst to her at the time, screen actor Charles Lawton had been working for months with German expat playwright Bertolt Brecht on a new play. The war was over and both men were eager to get back to show business. So it was. 
that Life of Galileo premiered in August of 1947 to rave reviews at the Coronet. With Frida as benevolent steward, the theater became a place not only for L.A.'s talented young artists to hone their craft, but for Rod Steiger to teach acting classes, for Betty Grable to practice her dance numbers, and for Rogers and Hammerstein to tend to their tedious business affairs. They had a West Coast office at the Coronet. Frida passed away in 1991. Six years later, her daughter sold the Coronet. Around that time, Mark Flanagan bought a small music and comedy club on Fairfax across from Cantor's Deli called Cafe Largo. He, too, had a vision. He immediately went to work renovating the club, creating an intimate cabaret room for live music and comedy. He wanted to shore in the club of L.A. slickness to cast off business cards, entourages, name-dropping, and to shed the tight, perfected monologues and camera readiness in the holy name of experimentation. But he wanted and needed something bigger. In 2008, he signed a lease on Frida's historic Cornet Theater about a mile away. He soon renamed the operation Largo at the Coronet and began booking young musical acts like John Mayer, and comedians like Sarah Silverman. Following them were Neil Finn, Robin Hitchcock, Ben Folds, Grant Lee Phillips, Ricky Lee Jones, Rufus Wainwright, Jacob Dylan, and Colin Hay. This historic L.A. haunt is now where Sarah applies her trade with the Watkins Family Hour. I wanted to hear from her how the theater and how Los Angeles had shaped her work. So you became a musician when you were younger in the town that you were from, but you became an adult in Los Angeles. And more befitting to our show, you became a true songwriter there. And uh, in, so in popular culture, there's kind of a cartoon image of Los Angeles that is vapid, shallow, and dark. The version that's kind of represented in Swingers or like a Guns N' Roses album or any laundry list of reality shows that take place there. But there is an element to Los Angeles, if you spend enough time there, that is old, that is local, that is unchanging, and that is much weirder than Austin, Texas ever could have claimed to have been. It, I'm talking about like the Big Lebowski side of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I feel like on many levels, but especially with your residency at Largo, you've really embraced the towny side of Los Angeles, how has L.A. shaped who you are as an artist? I love L.A. I think you're, you're, you've, you've hit the nail on the head as far as how, um, how it's seen and, and, and what, it, what it might actually be. Um, there, it's such a transient city. There are, I think that, that once you do move here and stay here, people believe that you're going to be around um it does it does definitely help your help your relationships and help you dig into the heart of of the just the the oddness and the uniqueness of of the city um i'm from southern california I'm from san diego so i'm that's about where i was was about two hours south of la and for the longest time i was just commuting up and back and forth to do rehearsals and shows and, you know, see shows and see friends. And, and eventually it just seemed like we should just start sleeping in the town that we're living in. Yeah. And it was the best decision because there, there is a great scene of, of musicians. A lot of people who, you know, have day job gigs and then um, want to play uh, for fun. And that, that's what the family hour was. There's a great community of people around it and a great um, collection of songwriters who I've, who I've come to know and, and get to, um, you know, one thing about the family hour is a big part of, a big part of, of it is playing with people you don't often get to play with, celebrating their songs and also, you know, cover songs that, that, that you have in common or, or, you know, and in learning the cover songs and learning a John Prine song, Bob Dylan song, uh, um, 
you know, a David Bowie song, you you uh, dig into the lyrics in a way that you can really learn from. I mean, for me, I learned so much more from learning a song, memorizing a song, than I than I will just by listening to it. Because mm. in the memorizing, I'm trying to bring a little bit extra logic to, you know, how is this fourth verse different from the fifth verse? Oh, it's developing this way. And yeah. they're bringing back the imagery from the second verse or the fifth verse. And that's amazing. And, 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 and you get to um, identify those, those little beautiful moments that become um, little, little jewels that you look forward to when you're singing the song. And my first uh, song that I ever wrote and played for anybody was um, a song just from the, the game where you pick a title and you write a song by that title. Um, Nickel oh, Creek wow. was on tour with Glenn Phillips, who we met through Largo. And Glenn Phillips um, was the, is the, the singer and uh, lead songwriter for Toad the Wet Sprocket. Mm-hmm. And he also has several great solo records that, um, that I love, including his, his new album. is is really, really great. And he uh, encouraged us to do this every 24 hours. We'd pick a title and write a song and play it for each other. And this was the first time that I felt free enough to um, to do it because it was silly. It was a ridiculous title that yeah. that that I found it impossible that Sean or Chris would write a great song um, or that he would even write a great song called Greer Zoller, which was the, the real the real the, the first title. And so I just did it and. And it was silly, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel the requirement of being profound yes. and serious. I could just, I could just, you know, it felt like popping a zit or something. Just yeah. get it out. <laughs> just stop it. Just like you know. No, that's like, great. Uh, just well, getting getting something over with, so it doesn't feel so sacred anymore. That is, um, and I a big can't agree more. Point for me. I can't agree more. When we think of what a lot of people think of is the golden age of music when you had the Beatles and the Stones kind of running around. They were releasing albums, you know, sometimes biannually, twice a year. Um, mm-hmm. So it getting the preciousness out of writing, um, one of the ways to do that and to make it feel less sacred, like you said, or like popping the zit, which I love, um, one of the ways to do that is say, cool, do what you want, but this is when it has to be finished. And... It really, it makes you make some choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I found that in co-writing with people that 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 comes up a lot too because there's um, there's a tendency sometimes when I'm writing by myself to get uh, stopped on on the minutia before the big picture is even spelled out, and um, I'll be writing with with someone else. Garrison Starr is a friend in, in Los Angeles who I've written with several times, and she. Um, she's really good at moving on and, Mm. um, or I wrote a little bit with Dan Wilson for this new record. And, and I remember realizing I, I was still hung up on a lyric, but I couldn't beat it. Mm -hmm. And instead of just stopping the whole process until I figured out how I was going to be happy with this one little Mm -hmm. turn of phrase or something that I had to just say, like, if you can't beat it, then don't even mention it, like, or, or put a pin in it, but do not, you can't stop the process. That's the, that's the worst thing. And so, um, and very often it will, it will work itself out by the end, you know, or, or you can come back to it, but, um, it working with people or working on a deadline really does help me, um, uh, with, with uh, a flow and not to get hung up on the minutia as much as the the big picture. Have you ever heard... I'm, Until you, and you can go back to the minutia. I mean, minutia will always be there for you. When you have some time and some perspective to pull back, you say to yourself, why was I holding on for dear life to this completely extraneous part of the project when this perfect kernel and the center of it was sitting right there for the taking? I often um, find that, or not often, but I, I have found that you know, a lot of times when I'm um, when I'm writing or when I feel like I am about, like I might have something to say, uh, I'll start with what I think I have to say, and then and just write, you know, two pages. Not necessar- not going for rhymes, not going for songs. Just just trying to sort of purge it out 
the thing that I have to say, the thing that I care about. And I find that I think it's one thing at, at the beginning and, and oftentimes what ends up being my last sentence will be me finally identifying what's at the core issue. What is the, you know, the new, uh, mm. the, 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 what, what everything else is swimming around. And, um, and then that might be the starting place, but often the, you know, the, the essence of the thing is not hung up on what you think it is like any issue. I mean, that's why songwriting is, is therapeutic because you, you, it, it, it gives you an excuse to indulge in, in, um, in, in the complexity of, of issues. And, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, oftentimes what's at the core is not this, you know, this selfish, this, this like, uh, very, it's, it's often something that is a bigger, more universal thing than you right. thought. You're like, so it's oh, very personal. I thought this song was about experience. summer love, but it turns out that I just hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, or it could be the opposite. Like, I find <laughs> that, like, that it'll be, like, a lot of times it'll be me bemoaning something or feeling, or not being happy or, or being dissatisfied with something. And, and then I'll find out that it's really a, about, um, a, a smaller and more universal topic. And ideally I get away from the couch time moment as my friend, um, Chris Dealey calls it and, and, and get more into a, 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 a bit of the truth that, that people can relate to. And, um, I say that having just written a record that everyone thinks I got divorced for this record. Like it's, 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 it seems like the most personal album and it is very personal, but it's not, autobiographical it, it it i was trying to um to to i was speaking about issues that aren't necessarily between a rom- romantic partners but um merely placed in that um in that theme mm-hmm. uh hoping that that it would be something that people can can digest in a way that that relates to them uh be it their work life be it their their family, be it their uh, personal struggles with with their own um, with their own uh, confusion or or searching. In the 1920s, Bill Monroe began spreading his unique brand of mountain music to American cities. Having hailed from Kentucky, the bluegrass state, he named his band. Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. After appearing on the Grand Old Opry in 1939, Bill and the Bluegrass Boys enjoyed enduring commercial and critical success as they forged their new bluegrass style. The band implemented elements of gospel, work songs, folk music, country and blues, showcasing various types of vocal harmonies. Their sound was characterized by two or three part harmonies sung over acoustic guitar, bass, fiddle, mandolin, and banjo. By the 1950s, Monroe was considered the father of the genre. Some years later, a young banjo player named Earl Scruggs joined Monroe's band. He developed an innovative three-finger picking style that eventually became known simply as Scruggs-style banjo. In 1948, Scruggs left Bluegrass Boys and teamed up with fellow alumni Lester Flatt. They called their band the Foggy Mountain Boys. Flatt and Scruggs spent the next 14 years bringing bluegrass music to television shows, universities, and coliseums, carrying the torch for the next generation. Today, bluegrass is an institution with meccas like Merle Fest in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, named for Doc Watson's son, Dell Fest in Cumberland, Maryland, named for Del McCurry, and the Telluride Bluegrass Festival, occurring annually. And Sarah, while you wouldn't want to pigeonhole her entirely in that tradition, certainly helps to carry its torch into the future. So anytime you have a beloved genre of music, there arises around it a very devoted community, as there should be. But obviously a drawback to that is 
communities can have a natural inclination to police their own boundaries and to kind of define sharply what makes us us and them them. Uh, And that sort of orthodoxy can be really detrimental to creation. I'm thinking of uh, Pete Seeger running around with his uh, apocryphal axe running to cut the power cord when Dylan went electric. I'm thinking of, you know, hip-hop purists in the 90s who would sneer at people who had guest appearances on their records. Bluegrass Mm. has a very strong community, and I would imagine it's one that can often have some passionate ideas about its own boundaries. Your body of work has never really recognized uh, those boundaries with bluegrass or roots music. Uh, Have you ever experienced any hostility to that, or have you ever been encouraged to stay more inside those more uh, traditional lines? There was a little bit of of um, friction very early on, but I think we um, at that point I was I was still touring a lot with Nickel Creek, and we were so um, the, the the great thing about it, having a band is you can you can live in your own universe and really focus on who you are as a unit and not. Um, be looking outside as much. You get to look at each other instead of out at the world. This is this is good and bad about bands. Right. But one of the good things is I think you get to you get to figure out who you are and as long as, you know, your bandmates are are on the same page and validating and you you are um you you are working well as a as a as a unit. Um you can go for a long time without really being aware of what anybody else is saying about you <laughs> and uh, or thinking. And so I think we, we really benefited from not, uh, not too terribly uh, much um, um, yeah. um, what confrontation in, in that, um, as far as like traditional versus not traditional. We, we just didn't get hired at those festivals. Or some people would complain early on, but it, it was so obviously not what we were interested in, in limiting ourselves to, or not limiting ourselves to, but focusing on right. those, those guidelines were not, were not our priority. So we didn't, we just didn't care. It didn't, it was like a bump in the road for, for the momentum that we had and the enthusiasm that we had for, for, you know, the music that, that we, 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 we loved listening to, um, I should say Bluegrass, et cetera, that band that, that I grew up listening to every Saturday night, Chris mm. Bealey's family was there. Uh, my brother, of course, was there with me and, and many other kids, and and we um, we saw this band play a lot of different kinds of music on bluegrass instrumentation. Right. So for us, it was um, a mandolin, banjo, fiddle, uh, and guitar on playing Beatles songs and Marty Robbins songs and Beach Boys songs and um, country songs from the '80s and. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, all that stuff seems very normal to play on bluegrass instruments now, but uh, for a lot of parts of the country in the 80s, that just wasn't happening. They, you weren't playing right. a ton of, of, of complex harmonies um, and, and, and tricky little arrangements um, on bluegrass instrumentation. So we, but that was our starting place. So it, um, I think, was very lucky for us to. And it suited us to to um, to have that as, as a primary experience with that, this instrumentation. It was never uh, never seemed it, was, it wasn't limited to uh, to bluegrass repertoire the way that you, you might have uh, had a similar experience in, in um, Kentucky or, or North Carolina or the, in any other uh, or other places at the time. Um, there, I'm sure there there were a lot of great progressive scenes at the time, but it it might not have been as prevalent as it is now. And um, I loved it. I it was it made songwriting <laughs> interesting to start with, though, because I remember, uh, you know, even just singing those traditional songs as a kid. It's not necessarily lyrics you identify with. Um, they don't. They they feel personal in that you love the tradition, you love these stories, and, and maybe have adopted some of that uh, as your own. But it definitely. Um, I don't know. I think it was it was really helpful eventually to to hear people like Glenn Phillips and um, and uh, Dylan and 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 um, Randy Newman and people who who wrote lyrically completely differently. <laughs> I mean, it's a yeah. big wide world, and 
and to finally see that curtain be opened um, as far as the possibilities of, of what you can what you can write and say it it all of a sudden was like okay well what what do I want to say what do I have to say yeah you listen How to Randy Newman and, and you think to yourself I'd imagine coming from a bluegrass background and listening to a Randy Newman album you'd say to yourself oh wow you can be sarcastic in songs you know like yeah, all that you, you can take this totally exactly yeah, yeah. How do you it's, view it's, um, it's incredible. How do you view an artist's relationship with their audience? What responsibility does a creator have to them, if any? What responsibility does a creator have to its audience? Mm -hmm. If any. Um I don't I don't know. I, I'm, I'm imagining like an extreme situation that I, I don't, luckily I don't find myself in. I'm imagining somebody who wrote a song when they were 16 and they hate that song. That song is not identified, with, the, the, the performer does not identify with that anymore. It's the writer. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's written badly. Maybe it's about something that they no longer stand behind. But imagine that that song is hugely popular to an audience. Right. I don't think that that performer has any obligation to sing that song. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I think that providing that their repertoire continues. Um, right. I, I think, I think that, I mean, I think it's, it's very nice and it's reasonable to make that, to, 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 to give people that because that, that might be something that, that, they, that the audience really cares for. I think it's, I think it's good business, and I think it is. Um, uh, but I don't. I don't. And I think it's really nice mm -hmm. if if you hate this song and you're going to play it because people like it, um, and for no other reason. That's really nice. That's a gift. That's that's sure. that's great. Um, I don't think. I don't know that at this moment that I feel there's an ethical obligation sure. to do that. Um, it's funny. But, uh, again, I. You know, people have paid a lot of money that says an assumption that you're going to play a song. It's nice to do that, you know? Arguably, you're giving them something else. You're giving them a lot of other things that you have worked for and that you stand behind. But I don't, I don't know that you have an ethical obligation to, to play, um, to, to, to do that. Um, and I, I do think that, like, what, you do, what we were talking about earlier, that writing, you know, it would it would be really um, it, it gets to be a lot a lot more work when you're doing something that you that you don't care about. Um, the the joy of being a musician is to get to care. Yeah. Um, on some level about what you're doing, and um, the joy of, of doing any job that you care about. Uh, people are a little bit less miserable with their work when they when they can put themselves into it and. Well, you, um, you must enjoy it because a brief glimpse of your tour schedule last year would suggest that you're not afraid of the road in the least. In fact, you enjoy it a lot. Um, what do you enjoy most about touring around and playing these songs for folks? Well, uh, I, I am really in, uh, enjoying the band that I'm playing with. I have, I've been touring mostly uh, as a, with a trio on this album with uh, David Garza and Michael Libramento, and uh, both of those guys are playing often two instruments at once, uh, and I am playing um, a few things as the show goes on, and they're incredible musicians. I've been a huge fan of David, fan of David for, for many years, and, and he's been a good friend, and I just met Michael this year, but it's been a really um, cool way uh, to, to find find a way into these into these songs every night with um with these players who are are so interactive and um that makes it really fun that makes touring really fun and satisfying and and totally worth it and i also i find that i i really i, I kind of like to um i've been enjoying just kind of jumping in the deep end lately Mm. Um, and committing to things I can't do so that I have to learn how to do them. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Such as? I don't, I don't really... <laughs> I'm just, I've been playing guitar more than ever before because I 
uh, I wrote these songs on guitar, but but performing songs and touring solo, uh, which I did in the UK for two weeks, that that was new for me, mm. and um, and and I feel like I learned a lot, and I'm way better at guitar than I was last year at this time, which is really exciting. Oh yeah, um, I have a long way to go, but um, but just encouraging to to um, to know that I can get better at stuff. <laughs> what is it about <laughs> trying something new, new on stage? Like right now, I play piano a lot at my house, and I record and uh, write with it quite a bit. And I'm just, in the last couple months, have started to put it into my show, and I'm terrified every night uh, before the show. But I've made more progress in the last couple months now that it's in the show than I did in the last five or six years playing it in my back room. What is it about putting these new skills in front of an audience that tends to uh, make them gel? It definitely makes it seem like you have to know it to a whole new, whole new level to feel comfortable doing it on stage. I feel like that way on, that way on song with songs too. Yeah. Um, you know, singing a song, recording a song on the studio and, and, and singing it around the house is totally different than, than playing it and singing it on stage. Um, mm. and with singing, I mean, I mean, I, I, even just practicing in front of a mic, I find like the posture is totally different. Yes. Um, and there's something about just knowing that when you start, you, you, you'd like to not have to stop when you play at the house. <laughs> you can, you can stop, you can restart the verse over. It's not a big deal. You haven't been put to that test, but you know, it, there, it's a, it's a little bit of a test to do it on stage. And, um, and I think because of that, it takes just that much more experience just to know that you can do it because you have done it. Um, that is, um, that's where that extra bit of confidence comes from, I think. But, um, I've, ha- I've had to yeah, take I, the- I totally relate to the, <laughs> the piano thing on stage. I don't play piano at all, but that's, that's Oh yeah. Me. I've had to take to like this mental exercise of, as it's going on, just saying to myself in my mind, Joe, you, you can stop playing this song right now, and it, it just it won't be the end of the world. It'll be all right, and and that kind of keeps me going. Uh, that thought, but isn't that funny? The thought of giving you up, giving up, sends, lets you keep going. I know. Well, hey, thank you for spending this time with me. I, I really appreciate it, Sarah. It, it means a lot to to give me an hour like this. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I love I love the podcast and I, I enjoy listening to it and I am right I was delighted to be invited to, to be a part of it. That's our show for this month. Thank you for listening. Sarah's latest album is Young in All the Wrong Ways, available everywhere digital music is sold. Today's episode was engineered and mixed by Matt Schusler, and it was written by myself and Paul Barbagallo, although I slouched while Paul did all the research himself. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive pair of jeans is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.